Okay, Kaizen. Um, this means Kaizen, uh, basically, and Kaizen is continuous improvement in any organization or even within yourself. And with the Kaizen, um, we're going to talk about how we can implement this continuous improvement and what are some of the roadblocks that we may come across and how we can uh, handle them, basically. So the first rule is your process should never be the bottleneck. So be, whatever process you're using, if that process, if that methodology, and when I say that process, it could be, uh, you might be documenting a lot, uh, it could be Scrum, it could be Kanban, whatever you're using, if that is causing pain, if that is causing problems for your team, right, then you're doing something wrong somewhere because that should not be. And that's one of the things why I like Kanban a lot because it kind of uh, integrates into your existing system and then does as much as you want or does as little as you want. Um, but your process should never be the bottleneck. And um, also you should not do something uh, just to do it. I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if it's right to say names uh, while we're alive, but uh, there is a, there is a, what is it, RSL club, I think, Icebergs in Bondi. Maybe a lot of you have heard it. They uh, actually used to have, just as any other club, you know, when you're entering the process, they used to have a big um, notebook and you used to go and fill in the cards. You know how you have to do it. And you used to take it and, and then go in. Then they changed it. They actually came up with a little touch screen, just one touch screen. And you have to scan your uh, driver's license and you have to enter your information and all that. But guess what happened? Even though it looks cool, it looks great, we're using technology and all that, where there was no lines really <laughs> when you were entering, now there are lines. Because one, not everybody is that accustomed to that kind of thing and also, Technology sometimes fails, sometimes it doesn't scan well, and all that stuff. So this is, in my opinion, something that's been done just to do it, just to look cool, but it is actually uh, diminishing the user experience, if you ask me. And I would ri much rather have the pen and paper and go in and enjoy my day instead of waiting in line. So that's one thing we have. And also, with the Kaizen culture, um, you can apply the Kanban board to almost anything. We talked about the software development, but if you look at it, this is a Kanban board for the whole, uh, that department. So maybe it's that project deployment, it's that product development, right? The whole thing that we had looked at, the whole Kanban board, the big Kanban board with the analyze, test and all that, is actually in that development doing here on that column. That column represents that. So it details to that almost, you know, master detail kind of uh, look. But in this one, hey, we have some features, we're doing some planning, which is different than analyze that the development team does, right? But in the same way, we have uh, some legal guys working on stuff, marketing guys working on stuff. And then what, what this does is, Again, just like the development process, you can see your bottlenecks in your whole organization, or in this case, the release of this product, as well as it forces people to talk to each other. Because you know that your team, uh, development team leader, once they see uh, something in the develop, I mean, they, they know this is a higher looking, like a bird's eye looking on the project, right? And once he sees something is about to happen, they can go to talk to legal team, or they can go and talk to planning team, which we, in Kanban, we call upstream and downstream. So you kind of talk to different stakeholders in the project, because a project may not be just that development. Coding, I mean, development, software development is not always just writing code. There is other things involved in it. Um, the hiring, I've seen, I've seen companies using uh, Kanban boards in their hirings, right? And in this case, uh, each uh, sticky notes uh, will represent the guy who applies for the job. And it's, they have stuff like, hey, in progress, 
uh, in progress as in to do, sorry, to look at, uh, interviewed, yes, no, and all that. So in one way, they can go, they can see immediately who is doing, which recruiter is doing what, and where that candidate's uh, position is. Another example. So it doesn't need to apply to your uh, software. So it helps you to see the big picture, so to speak. And it still needs, uh, sees you the uh, bottlenecks, shows you the bottlenecks. Another thing is, in Kanban board, if you look at it, everybody is everybody's customer. In this case, let's say that this is the um, product that we're about to release. We're about to release that product to our customers in the outer world, right? But I'm here to tell you that actually planning is the features department's customer. Development is planning's customer, and legal is development's customer, and so on, whatever your workflow is. And the idea is each department has to work on quality so you do not pass on a defective product to the next customer that you have within the company. Because if you do that, you're going to stall the process because they have to come back to it. Now you're going into waste. Let's say that. Uh, in this case, the planning's uh, requirements or the features requirements and whatever they want in the software that you guys develop is not clear. If it's not clear, you can bet any money that there's going to be a lot of back and forth talking, you're going to clear things up, or legal, if legal has done something wrong, when marketing goes with it, uh, you know, then all of a sudden you're faced with court, uh, you know, a lot of cases and all that. So basically, every department has to give good quality product to the next. So everybody is everybody's customer. In the development, software development, once, once we looked at the Kanban board, the testers were development, developers' customers. So as developers, we have to give quality product to the testers, right? And so on. One of the uh, biggest blocks or roadblocks that we have for Kaizen, which is the continuous improvement, is fear of change. Um, everybody is afraid of change, um, almost everybody. Um, and there is a reason for it. So allow me to tell you a little story, again, going back to uh, history, but this time we're going to go back actually, you know, tens of thousands of years. Um, we're all mammals, and we all have uh, three brains in ourselves. We have an inner brain, and that inner brain is responsible for automated stuff in our body, like breathing, our heart beating, um, our organs, you know, our blood levels, sugar levels, and all that stuff. It all controls this. And this is done without asking us, and for a good reason, because, uh, like, if you're like me, knowing myself, I'll probably forget to breathe most of the time. So this is done without asking us. Then we have a middle brain. And that middle brain, uh, of course, needless to say, the first brain has developed earliest, right? It's actually before you're born, <laughs> it's there. Uh, the middle brain is the one that protects us from stuff. For us, since from those times when we were gatherers or hunters, there was a lot of physical... Um, danger, so to speak. So that brain is responsible for getting us out of danger, is protecting us, right? For that brain, whatever is, uh, whatever we're used to, whatever is known, whatever is uh, accustomed, is good. Whatever is new is dangerous, potential danger. That is also the brain that if you're walking on the side of the street and you hear a you know, tire screeching and a car coming at you, that's the one that actually pumps adrenaline into your blood and gives you energy even if you feel tired and you run or you try to run from that car's direction, right? So it is there to protect you. And it takes over when it, when it needs to protect you. Then we have the third brain. And that, acts, that actually, when it needs to protect you, it actually does this without asking you just like the first brain, right? Because it doesn't want you to take over at that time. Then we have the third brain, which is uh, cerebral cortex I, th cortex, I think it's called. And this brain is the one that basically makes us a modern 
human being. Uh, this is the one that's responsible for language, for music, uh, for emotions, for analyzing stuff, for coming up stuff like, you know, PowerPoints and all that stuff. So this is the brain, though, that um, on the contrary to the midbrain, it basically says, hey, hold on, do not act so, uh, you know, do not rush into things, let's analyze this, let's see what happens. But unfortunately, they're usually at conflict with each other, this midbrain and the outer brain. Uh, it's called Almagidila, Almagida, or something like that, very Latinish word. Yeah, sorry? Amygdala. Amygdala, yes, that's true. And um, so basically, you know, they're, they're usually at conflict with each other. And while they're in conflict, the midbrain usually wins. This is why sometimes we say, after some things have happened, and we acted uh, or reacted in an emotional way, I could have handled that a bit better. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the other brain that's saying, yeah, you could have, you know, and, and that's when we regret things sometimes uh, that we do. But this Kaizen, continuous improvement culture, plays right into the psychological thing that we have. What happens is, when you bring something, a change, then the midbrain, Right now, we're not in uh, physical danger, but the business dangers, the business decisions, and all that are just the same for the midbrain. It's, it's primitive. It really doesn't know. All it wants to do is protect you. So if there's a big change, it says, hold on. I'm not accustomed to this. I need to protect you. Run away. So that's why some of the times, or most of the times, you see people uh, resisting the change. And also, the resisting the change, the protection comes in uh, at different levels. That resisting the change could be, you go and say, uh, hey, we're going to do from now on automated testing, UI testing and code testing. And if your testers, for example, are saying, no, 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 that will be bad and you know, you still, they will come up with bunch of uh, things, uh, reasons for not to do that. If somebody is doing that, just go deeper, chances are that person is, um, has fear and is afraid of maybe losing their job, maybe they're becoming redundant, they feel that, hey, you know, if we go all automated, what do you need? I mean, if, if, if our bosses come and say, hey, there's this great product, I say, hey, I want to have a Windows operating system and it gives me a new operating system, as developers, we will feel redundant and we'll say, oh my God, we're going to be out of job, right? It's the same thing. Um, that's why it happens. But the good thing is, this midbrain is primitive, as I said, so we can fool it a bit. That's where Kaizen comes in. Kaizen is continuous pr improvement, but in small steps. So if we make changes so small that the brain does not actually kick in, the midbrain does not kick in, and your defenses are down, but a lot of small changes can lead to big one big change, right? So you do not change everything. Maybe you do not do a, go on a full automated deployment at the beginning or full automated testing, but you do a, just a little bit and then add on a little bit and then add on a little bit, then you will see the resistance will drop. And you can try it yourself too. Whatever road path you're taking uh, coming to work, uh, try going in a very, very different way uh, be it car driving or walking, you will see that you will get very uncomfortable. If you just change a little bit every day, you will see that in a month you will get there still, you will change your whole path, but without really making yourself comfortable. You can try this anytime you want to. And this applies to all the things too. We, we use this, I think, on kids as well. You do small things, let them do small things, and you know, instead of uh, having them resist this. So this is the fear of change, and this is how we overcome this uh, fear of change. Are there any questions at this point? No? Cool. And then we have another uh, problem in Kaizen that comes in the form of suggestion box from the Western world. Um, the Western world has developed something called uh, the suggestion box. And they also found out that uh, actually nobody really puts anything into suggestion box other than like McDonald's uh, hamburger wrappers. And there's a reason for it because the workers have found out that whatever they put into suggestion box doesn't work. 
the management doesn't read it. So the, basically this is to say, if you're not going to follow up on something, don't do it. It's better not to do it at all than to lose your uh, employees' trust or your team's trust in that sense. So if you're going to say, hey guys, what can we do? How can we improve? And they say things to you and they will be excited. But if you do not really respect them, respect their ideas or discuss what that, those changes or improvements should be, it's better that you don't do anything at all because the other one is much more destroying to people and they will start not really respecting you at all in the future. And there's a, uh, there's a big cultural difference between Japan and uh, West or US in the sense. I say US because most of the statistics we get from US, they love taking statistics. And um, this is the suggestions per year that a Japanese worker does and a US worker does. So uh, a Japanese worker uh, does about, you know, suggests about 18 improvements per year, whereas US, you know, as you can see. But this was so small that I needed to put uh, US worker up to one to see where Japanese worker is. And that takes about six years for, so on the average, a US worker suggests an improvement once every six years. One suggestion per six years. By that time, the Japanese worker has done 108. Huge. But if that 108 was not respected or was not taken on board at all, and that one was, it will still be an improvement over it. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So for every hundred suggestions, the US or companies uh, take 38 of them and implement them. The rate for Japan, uh, Japanese companies is about 90%. What does that mean? That means collaboration. That means your team wants to be involved. Your team is involved. They're proud because some of the changes, it's, it's so weird in Toyota and in some of the other Japanese companies, uh, they actually have parts named after the uh, workers because they came up with these parts. Uh, how, many times do we, how many times do we call um, something a John Smith testing? We don't, right? We don't. I've never seen it done. Uh, the, but that's also a proud thing because that thing will live on forever. It's like you're almost, um, you're leaving something, you know, your legacy um, in a way. But that, that proud thing works. And uh, companies here, I think, should take on too. But that's part of that continuous uh, improvement process. So let's look at a couple examples of some of the actually uh, Western companies have done too. Continental Airlines, uh, they merged with U.S. Airlines a few years ago, right? In 1994, they were on seventh place when it comes to on-time arrivals. And their CEO said, hey, you know what? This is not acceptable. Really, seventh place, we might as well be the last. And I think they were like one above last anyway. Uh, and he said, I want to be in number one place soon. And what he has done is, he said, I'm going to give uh, $65 per employee, whoever it is. It could be the uh, janitor or it could be the CEO. $65 only, nothing, right? What is $65? But it's not the monetary thing that matters. It's actually the motivating the team to be number one that worked. And that's one of the main reasons why those two cultures work so differently, because where U.S. Uh, companies give big monetary awards for suggestions. They say, hey, the more money you save my company, the more I will give to you as a bonus. Whereas for Japanese companies or some now Korean companies and all that too, uh, who implement the continuous improvement, or I shouldn't say Japanese, who implement Kaizen, for those companies, it is basically the pride thing that an employee takes pride in uh, assisting the team to get better, assisting the company to get better. So it's not just monetary. You have to be proud of where you are too as, uh, as a worker, as an employee. And you have to be proud of what you're building as well. And uh, so this thing worked and uh, they were in first place in 1995. It worked so well that they were looking for saving some money that one of the air stewardesses, there is no 
uh, monetary reward involved in this, uh, said, hey, you're looking for saving money, but, you know, we have those trash bins that we take on the, you know, aisles to collect trash. Uh, we have our company name printed on them. What if we use the no, non-printed, you know, like a generic trash bins? And they said, yeah, you know what, <laughs> you're right. Why are we printing our company name on things that we throw away anyway? And they actually uh, saved a lot of money. But the moral of the story is these suggestions came from the workforce. It's not from the management. And uh, maybe management would not even think of this uh, because they're so far high up. And again, the Gemba, the workforce, who is working it at this time, the workers on the Gemba, the workplace, is the air stewardess. She knew, or he knew, I don't know, he or she, but they knew exactly what the problem was. And they said, and it's been implemented. So this time, it was management driven, as in they helped them, they encouraged them to do something, but they did not take this as a culture. What happened is, of course, we'll come back to our friends, these guys have this as a company culture. Um, in their Kentucky US plant, there is this guy one day, he is only responsible in uh, assembling the bolts. He looks at his bin. And he goes to a local, I'm going to say Bunnings Warehouse, because I don't know what they have in the U.S., but the equivalent of that. Home Depot? Yeah, it could be Home Depot. Yeah, true. Thank you, Amber. Um, okay, Home Depot is good. I'll stick to that. He goes to Home Depot. He sees a bin just like the one that he's using, and he sees that this is um, $7.95. He goes back to his supervisor, and he says, hey, how much is these beans that we're using? Um, how much do we pay? I'm just curious. And the supervisor says, look, I don't know, but I'll find out. He goes and finds out, and then fast forward, what happens is Toyota finds out that, hey, they're paying much more than, the, uh, than what the local you know, Home Depot sells these bins for, so they switch to buying local because of this guy. No reward or no anything, as far as I know, to this guy. It wasn't like, hey, you created this great stuff, thank you so much. Uh, the whole idea was that was so much in their culture that this guy automatically, when he saw, when he was in Home Depot for whatever reason, probably personal, uh, that he immediately connected the dots and he said, how can I improve my work condition or my company's condition in this case? And when he did that, he went to supervisor. Supervisor was not like, ah, you crazy, just a bin, just work. He didn't do that either. He actually took action on it. He looked for the price. He talked to the management. Then he takes it to the management. Management said, are you kidding me? A bin? You know? No, they actually implemented this too. So this is just their culture. And again, no reward is involved. One of the bad things that the Western companies do is, and we have this, we talked about Microsoft stack ranking, is basically competing individuals against each other. They're, they're hitting individuals against each other. And that works against a team. So if I'm a developer, you're a developer, we're both going to get bonuses on how well we do. There are a couple things that I want, basically. One, I would like you to screw up that I come in and save the day, right? All of a sudden, I'm hero. And guess what? When I sit down on the bonus table or performance review table, I'm going to be... <laughs> That's one thing. The second one is, uh, if you need help as a developer, and I'm a developer too, why would I come and help you? Again, go back to step one, go to step one. You screw up, I come and save the day. I'm much better. But this works against the team. So as a team, there is no way you can improve when it's like this. Uh, so that's why, uh, actually, this guy we talked about at the very beginning, I showed the uh, uh, nice guy that I said he's our hero, Mr. Deming. So what we do is we try, not try, we do not, we're against the individual performance reviews. We actually do team performance reviews on that case. So it's individual. Then you will ask, but how do you uh, get rid of the guys who are underperforming? There are other ways we can talk. Um, but that is the Kaizen culture. That is the culture that you want to implement into the company. Everybody is constantly looking for continuous improvement and everybody is happy and proud to work for that company. 
We talked about uh, stopping the line, and this is actually what happens with Toyota. I just wanted to give you, because we talked about the buggers, you know, uh, buggers, testers, when they hit the bug, uh, you know, how we actually call for help and stop the line. This is what Toyota does. They actually have these little cords, and they say, okay, this is how we stop the line, as soon as we see a defected uh, part, and this is the factory today, and they still use this system. Uh, they still stop the line if they see a defect part. And that was a bit of reference to our manufacturing uh, guys who came up with this thing. So I want to talk next about uh, another mental block that the Kaizen thing says, hey, we're already very successful. We're 99.9 .9 successful. We use Six Sigma. You heard of Six Sigma? How many people have heard of Six Sigma? Okay, cool. A lot of, at least half. Six Sigma is basically the ratio of uh, defect products that you have in the total number of things that you produce. And according to how many of those uh, defect products that you have, you get a ratio. There is a complicated uh, calculation with it. Uh, go and search on Wikipedia, the source of all knowledge, and you know they explain it there pretty well. But basically, the goal is to reach to Six Sigma, which is the number of defects is so little that you actually achieved a quality production. Well, what if I tell you that if you produce 50 mil, 25 million units and instead of units, you can put source code lines, right? The concept, the philosophy doesn't change. You produce 25 million units, 80 of them are defective. That's 6.01 sigma. That's actually over 6 sigma. So you're better than 6 sigma. Uh, that 0 0.1 matters because you will see if you're 59999, you're not considered Six Sigma. Um, so that's better than, what if I tell you though, this is a tire producer, that 80 tires will go, defective tires will go onto 80 cars that may cause 80 car accidents that may cause 80 deaths. All of a sudden that 99.9 .9 or Six Sigma doesn't look so good, does it? Or what if I tell you, this is a true story, the first one I made it up. Uh, the second one is a true story. I'm not going to give you the name, but it's a delivery company who delivers 3 million packages a day. Their success rate is uh, over 99.9%, nine, .9%, right? That still leaves 3,000 people not getting their packages that day. That should be getting. If you're 99.9 .9 looks great on paper, if you're one of these 3,000 people who is waiting for that package, it's tough luck. And of course we have this thing, don't fix it if it ain't broken, but look for improvements always, because just because something doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it's, uh, th something's working, doesn't mean that it's always going to work perfectly. For the reason that, uh, if you go back to software development, products need to change because customer conceptions change, customers change. The, what the customer wants a year ago, six months ago, is not the same as right now. Right? So we need to always look for improvement, just as the picture before, the slide before, we need to look always, try to achieve zero defect, if possible. Um, another mental block that in the Kaizen, implementing Kaizen uh, culture we have is, hey, no, no news is good news. Well, that's not the same. No news, that's not true. No news usually means uh, there is something somewhere somebody is hiding. Um, if you have kids, you know this, you usually would prefer your kid to make noise so you know what's happening all the time. If your kid is silent for a long period of time, that means there is something going on that's going to cause some trouble very soon, very fast too. Uh, same thing. Um, it's the attention to detail that's important. And uh, in this case, we need to look into uh, how we handle these, uh, th these reports. Just another story. Um, how many of you have heard a group called Van Halen from 1980s? Uh, Van Halen had a singer. Uh, his name is David Lee Roth. In their contract, they had this little anecdote that said, hey, we want a bowl of M&Ms in the backstage. And on these M&Ms, there can be no brown M&Ms. 
if we see one brown M&M &M or five brown M&Ms, whatever, there is a number there. If we see some brown M&Ms, the concert is cancelled, but the organizer still owes us this money. This is true story. They had this in their contract. Years later, they asked this to David Lee Roth. They said, hey, why did you do this? Is it just because you want it to be hard, you know? Is it like a stardom thing? He said, no, actually, on the contrary. This was our quality control system. Because if somebody doesn't care enough, if does, doesn't pay attention to the littlest details, that uh, they don't even care if there are brown M&Ms in the bowl or not. If you see a brown M&M, we will always know that there will be a problem somewhere, so we will do a whole line check, sound check, and everything, and every time there was a brown M&M, there was a problem that we needed to fix. And we fix it beforehand because if that happens in concert, obviously that's the same as you producing bugs into production, right? So there you go. Uh, the, just because something you don't see something, pay, paying attention to little details, there can be something there. So all these, the, we have all these mental blocks, fear of change and you know, uh, people trying to hide and uh, all that stuff. So how do we introduce a Kaizen culture then? One, we try to overcome these. We try to uh, tell people that, hey, this is okay, but it's also, we know that our workforce will make mistakes. We're humans. We make mistakes, and we make them a lot, actually. Um, sometimes it's a miracle that we go through the day. Uh, in my case, I make so many, not, not just coding, but, you know, um, I have the worst balance. I can actually fall when I'm walking straight, but... Anyway, we make mistakes. So how do we, do we have a policy to handle mistakes? I can tell you right now, you, if you don't let your uh, people do mistakes, there will be no innovation. Because innovation, by definition, requires some mistakes to be made, so you can learn from it and you can find a better way. There's a reason why um, when Edison was coming up with the light bulb, you know, they asked, hey, I, don't you feel bad uh, that you failed 500 times? He said, well, well I, I only need to succeed once. I just don't, I didn't fail 500 times. I just found 500 times of how not to do this. Uh, so while I'm not suggesting you let people fail 500 times, just let them know what are the mistakes that are allowed and what are, where are your red lines. Basically, you need to be very uh, clear with this. And here is something that Jeff Bezos from Amazon said, and we can probably all argue that Amazon is an innovative com company. He says, hey, we encourage our employees to experiment because we try to get the process decentralized without the cost getting so high that it doesn't make sense, but it helps our an innovation. So obviously, they do have uh, some kind of uh, Kaizen implemented in their culture. I don't know their company culture that well, but obviously they do have something there because the innovation comes from their people. That's what I understand. So going to another one, uh, shared responsibility. This is a timesheet, and this can happen in your company too. This is a timesheet actually uh, just like this. Somebody went to Mr. Deming, that we said our hero, uh, someday, and he said, look, I have a problem, our timesheets, we spend more time in correcting our timesheets than billing uh, our customers. And he said, give me your timesheet. He gave a timesheet like this, and he actually crossed over supervisor, and he said, you'll be fine now. And he was. And uh, what happened there was the worker was writing the timesheets, was putting in the timesheets, knowing that the supervisor will check, all these times, and thinking that, hey, my supervisor will check my time, so it doesn't really matter what I write. He will come back to me and will correct it. While the supervisor was, hey, the, my worker is such a good guy that he will write the correct uh, time in the first place. I don't need to check. He will just skimming over, uh, and he was signing the timesheet off, and it was going to the customer, and then the customer was coming back. No, <laughs> you know, and then a lot of waste again. Um, so in this case, the shared responsibility that they had uh, did not work. Once it was just on the hands of the employee, he knew that the supervisor is not responsible for sharing. Maybe he will sign it, but if there's a mistake, it will go back to him, right? Then the problem actually got resolved. And another thing that we might have is if we get too big too soon, we run into problems. So we need to do this controlled. And there's a very good example of this. 
who else our favorite friends Toyota uh, in 2008 there was a new uh, management in Toyota and they said you know what we're gonna be the world's biggest car manufacturer so what they did is they went around the world they opened new manufacturing plants and all that but in the meanwhile they lost uh, their control over quality the very culture that they implemented and they taught the world they actually abandoned it so between 2009 and 11 they had more car recalls than their history anytime in their history there you go if you grow too big even if you're Toyota who's the inventor of this whole Kanban just in production you know just in time and Toyota production system you still get into trouble and it's inevitable so for that matter, in your organization, it's best to have a policy. Deploy your policy, make your policies known by your workers. Uh, there's a company, it's Komo Komoto, what was Komatsu. it? Komatsu, thank you, Amber. Komatsu, uh, it's a, they build, they're like Caterpillar. They build those kind of machinery. And yeah, uh, industry vehicles. At the beginning of each year, uh, they give a little notebook to their employees, right? And at the first page of the notebook, it's a policy, the company direction from the CEO. On the second page is the, uh, that policy more detailed by their vice president, division manager, and then the plant manager, and then the, their supervisor. It just goes like, you can see where I'm going with this. Everybody is just giving a direction, company direction, based on the CEO's general direction, and it gets more detailed. And the rest of the notebook is uh, based on him, so he can uh, suggest, uh, he can say what he needs to do. He's going to write down what he needs to do to uh, get to this uh, goal that the CEO has put forward. Toyota goes as far as asking, sending a survey to the families, to the wives of their workers, saying that, what have we done wrong this year? Uh, did we do something that, um, that affected your family life? Can we improve this? And all that. So just whatever it is, it's best to be um, transparent, and then uh, your company will have the Kaizen uh, culture, continuous improvement, respecting your people, small steps, small increments, but continuous every time. So you check something and then you come back to it and you check it again and it's not a project, it's a cultural thing and then you will have it in your company genes. Thank you, I think that concludes our ultimate edition. Uh, we'll see you in December. Thank you. Did you get all that? We'll take the SSW TV quiz and test your knowledge now.